Welcome everyone to Training with Casey. This is Casey Cover, your host, and thanks for joining me. We try to talk about all kinds of things that are related to living and working with animals. Most of it is associated with training, but not all of it. Tonight, I'd like to talk about what I'm thinking of as the new age of animal training. Have you noticed this? I guess it partially depends on how long you've been around animals and how long you've just been around. So there's been a pathway and I think it's very exciting. And I have been, my, I, I've been working towards this for almost 50 years. And I couldn't understand why it was so long in coming and why there were such false starts and mm, manipulations, misuses. So I think no matter what kind of training you do, what kind of trainer you are, what kind of animal professional you are, we all want the very best for ourselves and the animals in our lives. We want the best medical care. We want the best health. We want the best um, cooperation, collaboration, communion, community. But boy, can we disagree on the best way to do that. So if you look at the pathway of you know, where we've been in the last hundred years and, or yeah, the last hundred years and where we are now, I would like to talk about two different paths. One is the path of industry, like animal trainers. And the other is my personal path and how I, you know, contributed and evolved and what I think is happening. So what, what is actually happening right now? Well, it seems to me that there's a big movement of animal professionals, trainers, ethologists, veterinarians, researchers that are all really evolving the way we look at and interact with animals. So instead of just compelling an animal to do what we want, we see much more care given for enlisting cooperation, much more care given for setting the animal up for success by looking at the environment and looking at the culture that the animal's working in. We're looking at way more nuanced methods for teaching and leading, inspiring, motivating animals. So what was this actual progression? And so it's going to be very, very brief. We can talk about it another time. I'd love to. And I'd like to talk about it with various people. And the first one I'll say is husbandry. Husbandry as in farming. So that's even more than farming. I mean, animals have been working for us for a long time. And so husbandry refers to taking care of the animals. But you know, at the in the 1900s, at least 25% of the American population was directly involved in agriculture. Almost everyone, my mom's family, then they didn't even live out in the country, but they had a milk cow. And lots of people had chickens and pigs. And you know, if you lived out on a farm, that horses were working on your farm and maybe the oxen were. And everybody had animals that they raised to eat or you know, chickens that laid eggs for them, sheep that you got the wool from. It's like the animals were part of everything. So when I say everything, if you understand 
farming and ecology and animals, you know that you cycle different animals over the pasture, for example, in order to take the best care and build up the pasture to its optimum. So maybe you would have uh, horses or cows go on at first, and then you would have goats and sheep. Then you would have chickens. You might not put pigs on it unless you were going to move them quickly and allow them to harvest all the acorns, for example. Or if you had a garden that you wanted tilt, you didn't go out and buy some piece of machinery. You could let the pigs loose on it. I shouldn't say you didn't, but you didn't have to. So uh, one of the things that happened in this era is that a lot of people knew a lot of practical things about animals because we lived and worked together in those days. But it wasn't all roses. Some people um, just were exploitive of the animals. And, you know, they didn't have a lot of room and so on. They went into little tiny areas and um, lived in the city, uh, like for livery horses, things like that. And of course, um, a lot of the animals had short lives and they were eaten for food. Now, I think they had generally better lives than animals in modern farms, but we'll, we'll just leave that on the table. Okay, so we had the husbandry aspect of things. Then, you know, especially after the Second World War, there was a real arrival of people, mostly men, that had trained animals for military performance. These were guard dogs, protection dogs, um, detection dogs. And we see books written by these people. And they were excellent trainers in many cases. One was um, William Keeler. And the relationship with the animals could be wonderful. I actually knew a number of the animals that Mr. Keeler trained and I met him and I spoke with him and he contributed so much to dog training and to dogs. He literally led the teaching that saved thousands and thousands and thousands of dogs from euthanasia. But the perspective was very authoritarian. It resulted in kind of like a master-servant relationship. And, or in, in some cases, people in the same area did nothing. When I was very small, I remember dogs just running loose in the neighborhood and the kids and the dogs would be let out in the morning. And then at the end of the day, they'd go home. And they go back inside and, and we'd all play outside for a lot of the day. And mostly it seemed to go just fine, but there had to be problems because dogs have always been dogs and there's always been cats and people and, you know, things get bitten and chickens get eaten. That's got to be a big one. So there we went from people having a very hands-on uh, working relationship with animals to having a more formalized authoritarian, but also working relationship with the animals. And I'm not saying that was bad for the animals. And um, in the case of Mr. Keeler, some of the things he wrote have been really, really attacked by others. And yet, overall, he did so much good. I think that's really important to recognize and that he helped the entire field evolve. So if we look at 
you know, if we continue to look at this, we'll start with Keeler and we could say pivot and pop to think of his technique. So his premise was kind of that the dog needed to teach itself to pay attention to you. And if you changed what you were doing, the dog needed to be aware of that and change with you, or he would get a leash correction, a pop on his lead. And if he didn't want to do that, it was totally within his power to stop that. He just had to keep up with you. Now, there's no problem for a dog. The dog can easily go as quickly as I can. But the idea is that that was his problem. You know, it's his job. If, if he didn't want to get a correction, he needed to make sure he was in the right place. Now, there's another thing I could say about that. And um, what it is, is that I think we need more explanation. I think it's the responsibility of the trainer to actually explain to the animals what we're doing and what we want. And that is what wasn't present in that technique. So there was no luring, but there also was no use of target, no use of explanation, no use of demonstration. And the dogs figured it out pretty quickly. And experts were very nuanced and things just flowed along, but it could be a rather severe way of training. And especially if you weren't nuanced or the dogs were not so fast at figuring things out. So pivot and pop, you change direction. And if the dog doesn't keep up, he gets a leash pop. And from there, we can go to pressure and release where the animal gets a cue through leash pressure that something is about to change. It gives them a little heads up. And then he can decide how quickly he wants to comply, but that pressure will not release until he complies. And um, a favorite trainer of mine, Chad Mackin, has said that everything is pressure and release. And I can kind of see that but I think at our very best with animals, it can be more an anticipation and a recognition rather than a pressure and release. So for example, uh, my horse is not a dog, of course, but they learn very much the same way. And if I say to my horse, we're going to do four steps front, eight in a turn to the left, eight in a turn to the right, then we'll back up eight steps. My horse will just nod and immediately start walking four steps front, eight to the left, eight to the right, back, 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 et cetera. She's telling me, I heard you. You don't need to repeat it. This is what you're saying, correct? And of course, yeah, that is it. So when she gets the information, you could say it's pressure because I'm raising an expectation, but that's so subtle and nuanced and she eagerly moves right into doing this thing. Like she likes doing this. Okay, so pivot and pop, pressure and release. Halters, I wasn't quite sure where to put halters in there because I became aware of them a little bit later and I'll go ahead and put them in there right now because uh, they're a more indirect way of directing an animal. So you put a halter on either their head or their body. You might call it a harness if it's on its body. And the point is that you can control some aspect of the animal's movement. So some of these halters pinch the animal, some of them just contain them. And the reason I put it where I did is that we've always had halters for horses. 
both for their head and also if they're going to, you know, harness, if they're going to pull a wagon or something like that. Cows, same thing. It predates every kind of training method that I'm going to list here today. And one of these that is often billed as the most, you know, progressive halter, I'll say it's billed that way by the people that want to use it, and that is the head halter. And it's pretty much my least favorite tool. But it's not just that, because my opinion doesn't really matter. The dog's opinion matters. And to my surprise, I have asked a number of dogs what collar they prefer. I literally give them a choice between collars before we go out for a walk. And to my amazement, they will often choose a prong collar over anything else. And there are so many people that are against prong collars, and yet that is specifically the collar that I see dogs choosing. Go figure. It wasn't my favorite, but it's not my neck either. So there's a number of reasons for that. Maybe we'll do a podcast on that if you're interested. But halters. Okay, so what came somewhere after halters? Operant conditioning. Now, operant conditioning isn't a new invention. It's a, a study of the way learning happens or can happen. And of course, I should have listed before operant conditioning, classical conditioning. So what is that, you might ask? Classical conditioning is the incidental association of cues from the environment with important events that in turn elicit physiological responses. So you probably have heard of um, Pavlov and he rang a bell when he was going to feed dogs, as I recall. I hope that's accurate. Anyway, and the dogs would salivate because they quickly learned that the bell predicted food. So there was nothing very complicated about that, but it was a sub an unconscious form of training. So we didn't go and talk to the animals about, okay, now we'll bring your food. And, oh, don't you worry, you're going to love this food because it's prime rib. Or in the case of dogs, maybe more to the point, road apples. And the animals um, would then start salivating or licking or whatever was associated with eating. So how is operant conditioning different? Operant conditioning refers to operating on the environment in order to gain something. So if you wanted a banana, you could stack up cubes so you could climb on top of them and get the banana down. If you wanted to get a treat from your human trainer, you could follow their suggestion and uh, get a treat. So the operant is the action that the animal performs in order to get some payment from the environment, and you might be in that environment, you as a trainer. So there came along a form of operant conditioning, a subset of it, that had its own special rules. And in frankness, a lot of the rules were not part of operant conditioning. And they were presented as being part of operant conditioning. And, um, but it, it got publicized in a popular book and lots and lots of people started training that way and not necessarily going back to learn the more complete system 
of operant conditioning or sometimes called behaviorism. And I found that frustrating because clicker training actually came behind another form of operant conditioning, which didn't have a name, didn't have a separate name until 1990. I'm actually the person that named it. And I'm not exactly proud of that, but it needed to happen. And um, the reason it needed to happen is that dolphin trainers, marine mammal trainers, um, led initially by Keller Breland, who was a student of uh, Fred Skinner. He had developed techniques that allowed them to train marine mammals for the U.S. Navy in the open ocean. And he then went on to train lots of other kinds of animals to do all kinds of interesting things. Just a really, really fascinating person and fascinating accomplishments. But they just called it operant conditioning and behaviorism as far as I could find so far. And it wasn't, it wasn't because it used a very important tool, a target and also a bridge. So I hear dog trainers a lot of times talk about uh, reward markers and a bridge. You could call it a reward marker, but an operant conditioning person would not call it a reward mar marker because we're not supposed to talk about rewards. We're supposed to talk about reinforcement. Reinforcement is where the behavior is increased, whereas reward is where the animal is happy or gratified by something. And Skinner argued, we don't know that. We don't know how the animal feels, but we can tell you whether or not the behavior, this particular behavior was increased or reinforced. So the bridge got its name because it bridged the gap in time between the trainer cueing the animal, the animal responding to that cue correctly, and the trainer getting food or another primary reinforcer to the animal. Primary just means something that the animal automatically uh, would increase its behavior in order to get it. It's usually food. But it could be a great scratch or it could be an opportunity to go for a walk or whatever. Okay, so we have bridges, okay, which tell the animal you did it right and let me get something for you for that. So you might ask, well, why would you, why wouldn't you just give them the food? Well, because if you're working in the open ocean with dolphins and seals and sea lions, they might be hundreds of feet away when they do what you need them to do. They might be underwater and they might be a thousand feet underwater. If you look at the case of Tuffy, the bottlenose dolphin that showed us that dolphins could go that deep. So we needed to be able to give the animal feedback that they were successful and correct before we were able to actually get food or some other reinforcer to them. Now, the second tool that we had was the target. And target is both a verb and a noun. You can target an animal and you can you know, target them as in have them target on a contact point. And the contact point itself is also called the target. So for me, a two finger target looks like this here. And then when the animal targets, he makes contact so here, X. Okay, so the X is the bridge. The here is the cue. This hand is the animal. This hand is the target. Here, good, 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 good. What is that good, 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 you might ask? Well, that's the intermediate bridge. And that's something that I brought to the field in also 1990 because we were doing 
some work that really required these little pigs to be very patient and hold very still. And so we didn't want to just say hold and or target or hear, well, those are all cues that are often used for targeting, and then have the animal come make contact and then get discouraged and just drift off the target. So I postulated that if we used an intermediate bridge to tell them you're on the right path, stick to it, and you will soon be successful. And that was the intermediate bridge. And it started out being X, 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 X. So the X is the terminal bridge and the X, 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 X is the intermediate bridge. Now you may be going, didn't you just say good, 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 good. Yes, or do them any of those ways. The animal just has to understand that the sound that you are giving is a bridge sound. So when we're teaching the bridges and targets, we always routinely teach at least two different ones. And um, that's because your tongue will get tired. And you'll want to switch from time to time. And once you teach two, they'll generalize. You know, you could say almost anything and they get it. So we have the bridge and the target that are used in conjunction with operant conditioning and made it a very much more efficient, effective, and fair way of training. Because in clicker training, at a time when I, using um, bridge and target, could routinely teach an animal to target in like five minutes or less, um, the clicker training sources were saying that it would take six to 12 weeks. And the reason is probably that they didn't, like Keeler, they didn't have a way to explain what they wanted. And so trainers were instructed to go stand in the middle of the room like a tree, literally like a tree, and just dole out reinforcers when the animal happened to do something more like they wanted than it had been doing. So if you wanted an animal to lie down, maybe the animal sat or maybe he bowed and that was more like laying down than running around the room. So maybe you would reinforce for that. But maybe then in his excitement, the animal would pop back up. And also there was a lot of reliance on using props. Uh, so for example, there were demonstrations of teaching people to write with chalk on a chalkboard or teaching people to go out a door. And so they would go near a chalkboard and there'd be chalk on the little tray and they, the trainer, the so-called trainer would stand there expectantly. And if the person went near the chalk, they would get a reinforcer. And if they picked up the chalk, they would get a reinforcer. And if they put the chalk on the board, they get a reinforcer. And if they drew on the board, they get a big reinforcer. What's the problem with that? That person has already been conditioned to understand that chalk and chalkboards are used together and how they are used together. If you wait for a dog to go to the chalkboard and pick up the chalk and start to write on the board, you're gonna be there a while, quite a while. And that's not necessary. You can actually teach an animal very, very quickly to um, go to a board and pick up a piece of chalk and write on the board. But not only did they not have a way 
to explain things to the animal, they came up with a way to get the animal to move. Um, they use food to lure, okay? They gave that most of the people that were doing clicker training gave up standing in the middle of the room and waiting for things to happen and started luring animals. And that had two problems because um, people would have a hard time phasing the food out. And also there's, well, actually has three problems now that I think about it because they had problems phasing the food out at the end. They also had a problem because food is arousing and the animals would run around after the food, maybe get more excited, more aroused, and not necessarily be thinking about what they were doing. So you'd have the appearance of a trained behavior without it being understood by the animal. If the animal would repeatedly do that thing, it was unconscious rote learning. And it, that has problems. That has lots of problems. It also could create a sense of entitlement to the food that could lead for a, to aggression. Okay, so in a bridge and target, and in bridge and target, you could even imagine a target, which is a contact point that's extended where the animal can meet it. And I usually start with my you know, fingers, but for certain animals like lions and tigers and bears, I would not do that. I would start uh, usually with an extension of a target, either a target pole or a target station. And these things, you don't have to buy anything. This can be a target station. And if you want to get fancy, you can make a little bullseye to help focus the animal's attention there. So again, it takes like two minutes to teach an animal to do uh, both bridges, to understand both bridges, and to do the finger target, the pole target, and the station target. And from there, you can then just demonstrate what you want. For example, if you want the animal to you know, come to you, just say here, okay? If you want the animal to do a high jump, use a target pole to extend your reach over your head and you say here, or jump or whatever your cue is gonna be. Good, 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 good. Okay, and then similarly, send them out to a station. Now, when I say this takes two minutes, I'm not kidding. I'm not leading you on. We do it day after day after day with lots and lots of animals, all different kinds of animals. And it's just so incredibly fast. But what about our other professionals? And so we have, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to tell you about SATS and how it's different. Let me see if I want to tell you that first or second. Now I'll go ahead and tell you about SATS and then I'll talk about the other collaborators. SATS is kind of got four main aspects with animals right now. So we, we've got a program to teach the animals resiliency and self-management. Everybody needs this training and information. Trainers will say to me over and over again, I had to use the condition relaxation on myself today. I use it all the time. Okay, so we call that particular branch perception modification. We also have building block training. So we don't just teach a single rote behavior. We teach pieces of behavior that we can combine limitless ways. 
So rather than teaching, you know, uh, run up to this particular target and push it. And that's going to be a doorbell. And then we're going to switch the name to doorbell. We're going to teach target the fingers, target the pole, target the station, watch a target, good, 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 good. And there's other targets we'll teach. Then we'll talk, teach uh, distance and direction. Can you go out to this target from here to here? From here to here, going like from inches to feet to here to here, from here to across the field to that target out there. And um, duration, can you target for an instant? Good. Can you target for two instants? One, two, here, good, good, good. Can you target for four? One, two, three, four, here, good, 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 good. Can you target for eight here? Good, 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 et cetera. And it goes this quickly. It goes this quickly. The way I'm explaining it to you, it's exactly how we teach it to an animal. So you guys are pretty much ready to go test this for yourself. But then let's say I want to teach an animal a send away to go across a, a ring a an obedience ring for example and go to a station and stay there so now i can say can you go to the station target that's you know 100 feet away and wait there for 16 or 32 or 8 or however many ready set go good 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 good, good. when he makes contact one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good. Call him back, etc. So we can combine all these pieces of behavior in all these different ways. And that's called bridge and target training. Then we have cognition. Cognition. People are catching on to it now. But boy, has that been a hard sell. I've been working on cognition with animals, two-way communication. Since I was at the National Zoo in 1979, the workmen at the zoo made a rack for me so that I could hang up all these linoleum uh, graphics. And each one was a word. So if it was a verb, it had a white background with a black symbol on it. If it was a noun, it had a gray background. And there were three or four rows. And I hung these things up on this rack with shower hooks. And you know what happened? The animals were so fast at answering. What kind of fish do you want? And maybe I had eight fish up there for them to choose from. Butterfish. I'm still saying I just got all those set up. Now I've got to take them down and offer another choice. Or I can put them all up, but even so, you know, I'd ask them 10 questions. They go ding, 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 ding. We're done. It was too clumsy. So you may know now that I pretty much use a binary toggle like so and i'll assign a different meaning to the thumb and the uh, little finger all the time i want to make sure the animal's actually listening to what i say and doesn't get into a habit of always picking the thumb because that's normally correct so they have to listen to what i say and to what I assign. So if I say, do you want, if if I say, do you want food? Yes, with a thumb. Do you want food? Yes or no, they pick yes with a thumb. Then I say, do you want food? No or yes. You have to be listening because if they pick the thumb again, they're not gonna get food. 
And that allows us to check to make sure that the animal is actually paying attention. And in fact, when I was at the University of Maryland and we taught cows to tell farmers if they want, or scientists actually, if they wanted food or a date with a bull, the animals would make their choice and we would not do anything until they went to the choice station. So if they picked a date with the bull, they had to go to the gate that led to the bull's enclosure. If they picked food, they had to go to the food table. And if a cow went to the wrong station, it ended the trial. They never went to the wrong station, not once. If the cow picked the bull, she might not want to actually date the bull. She might want to eat his food, beat him up, look at his area, but she did want to go where the bull was. If she picked food, she didn't turn around and go, oh, dang, I meant to pick the bull. Please let me in with the bull. It didn't happen like that either. So what we do now with cognition is we systematically build vocabulary. So I teach the animals labels for everything, individuals, activities, locations, items, food, you know, uh, triggers, doesn't matter what it is, everything gets named. Then we teach concepts, things like over versus under, around versus between, right versus left. And I always teach in opposing pairs. So the next thing, the, the fourth main area of SATS right now is inspiring collaboration. So I, I think that, no, well, first of all, I must say that I am, I have the liberty of not having to make animals do much anymore. I used to ha need them to do shows up to 14 times a day or um you know the same behaviors over and over again and when i left working for other institutions i decided i didn't want to have an animal working with me if they didn't want to work as much as i did and if you watch the videos most of the time animals are off lead when we're working together and even if they're on lead, a lot of times you'll see the touch is very, very light. Like I'm giving information, but I'm not really making them do anything. And what we do instead is we offer them choices and we honor their choices. And we, when we honor their choices, they're empowered to help direct the training. And so let me see if I can think of a good example. So with a rhino that needed to get his abscess flushed, I was just like, you can do it this way where you can control it or they're worried about you, they're going to bring in the squeeze chute. And I had his attention. He knew what a squeeze chute was, apparently. And he could have been anywhere, but he came right to this interface where he and I could talk. And in a single session, he allowed me to put first air and then water into the abscess under his horn. I mean, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal because he wouldn't let anybody do, do that or really get too near his horn for eight months and we did it in a single session. But what we did is we put the control in his hands. You know, you, you can do it this way or, you, or they can do it a different way. And I'm here to help you if you wanna try to do it this way. And the first thing I did is explain everything. And if you wanna see that video, that's at cinelia.com slash press and just scroll down to the bottom of the page and you'll see all the videos and the rhino one is like first or second so 
we get collaboration from the animals. We get cooperation. We get them driving their own performance. So this is the path from the animal training perspective as I have seen. Now let's talk about what other professionals are contributing. Well, first of all, we have ethologists. Ethologists, um, such as Kim Brophy, study what the animals normally do, what their life is like under natural conditions. Who are these animals? What do they need to be happy, healthy, successful, and successful with us in our strange community? So for example, if you went to an ethologist and you wanted to keep a wolf as a pet, and you were also a gardener, an ethologist would probably suggest a, don't keep a wolf, and B, don't keep a wolf in an area with plants that you want to have live because it is just second nature for a wolf to go out and mark the landmarks in his area. And that's like every place where he makes a turn, right? On his patrol around the property. So at zoos and so on, you'd have a line of trees and the wolves would just pee to death a tree, pee a tree to death. And that tree would die. And then the next tree was under assault and so on. So if that was important to you, an ethologist would help you to set things up so that you wouldn't have a war with your wolf or you wouldn't have a situation where you were both unhappy. What about veterinarians? Well, not only do veterinarians try to help us keep animals healthy, but they are now really grappling with stress problems. The pathologists that I've worked with, both in human medical research and also with exotic animal care, have all said that um, disease is 90% stress. So if we can help the animals to avoid stress, they're going to be more likely to be healthy. So how can vets do that? Well, there's lots of ways. And one that I'm delighted to see is fear-free. I'm delighted to see it because it represents a huge change in the way animals are treated. Instead of taking animals and just restraining them and doing whatever you need to do, no matter how violated the animal feels, no matter how terrified or traumatized the animal is, you got that shot or you got that tooth looked at or whatever. And so with Fear Free, the people approach the animal, maybe they let them stay on the ground instead of getting up on a table. Um, the medical staff use pheromones, uh, which are signaling molecules, which in, in this particular case, signal calmness and safety. And so when the animal goes in, instead of hopefully, instead of smelling the stress and worry of the animal that was in the room just before him, he's going to smell, you know, like, analogous to ma grandma's cookies or grandma's baked bread or whatever, right? But something that he makes him feel at home. And uh, they're also starting to use food. And this is fantastic. Now, I already made a podcast on what else we can do, which we really need to do, which is actually even easier. But notwithstanding, the fact that the vet industry is moving in this direction is fantastic support for us and our animals and a huge step in the right direction. Okay, then we have dog walkers. And 
there and daycare centers where the animals are supported in having meaningful exercise activities. You know, there's pack walkers where they take a bunch of dogs out together and maybe they go to a lake and go swimming or they hike for five miles or whatever. It's not just a walk around the block or even a walk for a mile. It's a walk on some activity that has maybe some novelty and some challenge and it has social components. And that goes for both pack walkers and a lot of regular dog walkers and also doggy daycare. So um, help me out here, guys. What else do we have here? We have people like uh, Yak Ponksep who determined that there's a progression in relationship building and that's necessary preparation for optimal learning. And for example, a dog needs to feel safe. A dog needs to feel comfortable. A dog needs to feel that he can play, et cetera, et cetera. I believe Dr. Ponksep had um, seven steps that a dog needs to go through. And this is helping trainers to address other needs that the dog has. In other words, a dog isn't a blank slate that we go in and we just tell them what to do and give them consequences if they do it or don't do it. A dog is a living, feeling being and needs to be supported as such. He needs to have an opportunity to build comfort and build confidence and to express himself in relationships with his owners, but also with his trainers and so forth. Uh, we have the recent work with the genome where we see that dogs are much more like us than we ever imagined. Um, work with the MRI where we learn that dogs have a lot of the same abilities that we do, that their brains operate in very similar ways. It goes on and on. So all these different disciplines are coming together to support the recognition of dogs and other animals as more intelligent, complex, feeling, thinking beings. And they're even giving us guidance in how to better approach them. So I actually already accidentally told you the history of my path, but I'll just summarize it again. I, you know what I want to tell you is that I didn't even consciously remember this for eons. But when I was a kid, I saw a trainer of, I think the dog's name was London. He's a German Shepherd Cross. And he starred on The Littlest Hobo, which was a Canadian television show. And it's Charles Eisenman. And he had three dogs on the Merv Griffin show. And he talked to those dogs with language, just English words. And I remember that he told the dog to go look in the file cabinet for a piece of paper, I believe. And he even was able to spell certain words and the dog knew the dogs knew the words by the spelling, not just by saying file cabinet, but by saying the F-I-L-E cabinet, et cetera. It was very impressive. I wish I could have worked interning or you know uh in volunteer work, learning getting mentored by Mr. Eisenman but I never ever con came into contact with anything he wrote or did except for that one uh Merv Griffin show in fact I never saw the show either uh, that he did in Canada but 
he was so important to me because he taught me at the age of, you know, like 12 or something like that, that animals certainly can understand language. And that was very influential to me. So I went on and I worked with, my family had all kinds of pets and I had horses and dogs and I trained the dogs, um, Irish Clutter, Irish Setter Club of Central California with JQ Zenga. And they used the Bill Keeler method. And I learned how to do that. And I showed dogs and um, did obedience training and many other things. And that's where I met the Keeler dogs. And by the way, the Keeler dogs were in various Disney movies like um, Homeward Bound and the Big Red movies. Amazing dogs, amazing training. And I want you to know that these dogs were so well balanced. I mean, it was amazing to meet these dogs. <clears throat> and then, excuse me a second. And I never had any professional mentoring with the horses. My dad had been kind of a farm boy and he just, you know, figured you just pick it up. And so I never learned from any um, actual horse trainers that had much of a chance, like no lessons or anything like that. So I went off to school and I started training marine mammals in the lab of Dr. Jerry Coyman. And we did a lot of work for metabolic studies. So we had to do some interesting things like uh, get the animals to breathe only into a cone that led to an air source that had hydrogen gas in it so that they could measure the lung volumes and so on. And we were able to do that. So how would you do that? How would you get an animal to hold his breath until he got to this cone and to only exchange air in this cone? And oh, by the way, when he got out of the cone and barked and found out he had a Mickey Mouse voice, there was a conversation to be had. They were not too happy about that. So we were able to do some pretty demanding, interesting things. And we were using operant conditioning. And from there, I went to Mystic Marine Life Aquarium where operant conditioning was, you know, de rigueur. That's what everybody used all the time. And then from there to the National Zoo. Now, at Mystic, I did use operant conditioning all the time, but I did start working with, in this case, American Sign Language with a dolphin so that I could spell words for her and tell her things that other animals wouldn't necessarily recognize what they were. At National Zoo, we started working with the two-way communication with the gray seals, first of all, but also with the other animals. I was there for eight years, University of Maryland, and we were teaching cows, as I mentioned, to tell scientists if they want a food or a date with a bull. We litter trained a horse, I think two horses actually, we did the voluntary blood sample collection with the swine and a lot of other little projects. And by that time, I was really on to this whole two-way communication stuff. When I even tested things like, you know, those um, color blindness tests where you have two colors that if you have a certain form of color blindness, you will only see one of the two colors. So they'll have a color and they'll intersperse it with dots that make a number like six. But if you have color blindness, all you'll see is the dots of the first color, not the color that makes six. And I made a bunch of colored targets, uh, not cut, like language cards, words that were graphic. And then I found out that dogs don't see the same colors that we do. 
And rather than redoing everything in white to black, white gray tones and black and yellow and blue, I photographed all of my graphics cards in black and white. And what I found is that um, most of the signals, most of the symbols already had really good contrast. And so we were able to just keep developing this two-way communication. And now my horses understand more and more words. Sarah definitely understands over 500 words and concepts. So all of this has led me to realize that I have to teach these animals cognitively. I can't leave them out of the conversation. And when I bring them into the conversation, we get so much more engagement. The animals are so much more interested in meeting the challenges. Um, it's important to recognize their contributions too. So for example, I mentioned that my horse will um, immediately start to move through a sequence that I described to her. And I think it's important for me to say, yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And how about this? Do you want to go left and left here? Or do you want to go left and right? And ask her opinion. And then try it both ways. We can see if it works or not. So two-way communication, I think, is huge. In fact, I think it's so huge that we're working on reuniting, not reuniting, reconnecting my horse with her good friend who also left the stable and now is living um, lots of miles away. And I was thrilled because the owner of the other horse is interested in letting them talk by FaceTime. And we'll probably, if that works, we'll definitely be sharing it. So where else do we need to go? We need to go to a place where we recognize that all animals need to learn how to mitigate trauma, you know, how to heal themselves from trauma, how to manage themselves, how to constructively use the resources around them. And there's all kinds of crazy ways. Like I've known of some dogs that like to um, use their toys to make like live art, right? They'll stack them up in various different designs, dog artists. I've known dogs that were psychic that would, you know, connect with others and go do strange things. I had a dog that, um, was walking across the living room floor and all of a sudden screamed bloody murder and peed and pooped like it was like he'd just been terribly shocked and he couldn't even walk. And so I got him to the vets and got him some treatment, which wasn't very effective, it, it turns out. But I called the breeder to see if she had any idea what could be going on with him. And she told me that at the exact moment that this had happened, his mother had died. And he had another brother who was also very sensitive. So they had like, I don't know, nine puppies in this litter. But my dog, Duncan, and this other dog named Cody had both done something very similar at exactly the same time. And Cody was off in Washington State, and Duncan's mother was, uh, I don't remember where she was, but anyway, she passed over at that instant. So the needs of animals are much more complex and much broader than we have formally rec formerly recognized. And it's great that we are you know, coming up to the challenge. And we need to just keep going to keep incorporating interesting, meaningful things 
that we can do together. I think every dog needs a job and a job. Well, let's say an avocation, something that they love doing that's challenging, interesting, and provides them a means to make a contribution. And they'll tell you, they'll tell you what they want to do. And you need to find the time and the means to go do something meaningful with your dog. And they love to walk and everything, but it, I think it needs more. Anyway, I've talked about the evolution of training. As I saw it as a trainer, I'd like you to check out some fantastic people that have been on the podcast recently. And I was so excited to talk to these people, kind of forgot myself. And I talked with them rather than just drawing them out. So maybe they'll come back again and we can do it again and get even more information from them. But these people are just coming at it from um, neurobiology, ethology, nutrition, you know, you name it. And it's really exciting and really great to see. For all the trainers out there, you have been threatened sometimes um, by animal rights extremists, sometimes by other trainers for your choice of tools or for your methodology or for who knows what. And I'm, I'm not one of those people. I think that there are so many dogs that need help that let's say I didn't like your tool. What I like less than your tool is the fact that this dog is going to die if he doesn't get help in adjusting to human culture. And so whatever your preferred tool is, if you can help this dog, by all means, get to it. We don't have enough people helping all the dogs and all the people that need help. However, whether it's good for dogs or not, people are, they keep constricting the tools, they keep raising the requirements. And guess what? The people that are imposing the requirements are not necessarily the best trainers. They may just be the best administrators, the people that don't train and they go lobby the lawmakers instead, and they're going to control the best trainers. So the time to act on it is now. Look at your tools. Do you really want to have to rely on any kind of tool or device? Do you want to be able to move into a situation where the animal is driving his own performance? And so it goes. So I I'm support the other trainers, uh, whatever you use. I don't necessarily use these tools myself. However, the most important thing in my mind is to get help to these people and dogs and other animals, but the handwriting is on the wall. You're getting more and more pressure from people that may be totally misguided and erroneous, but they're still being effective in controlling what we do. So either we need to get out there and do more lobbying and more talking to, you know, our legislators and educating people, or you need to make sure that you still get your job done without relying on these tools. Hey, thank you very, very much for sharing some time tonight. And please uh, comment. I'd love to hear what you think about this and a great day. We'll see you next time. Don't forget to share this podcast, please take care.